always read so well. You know, the first time I ever spoke in church was for Youth Sunday, and I was to do the prayer of invocation. And I, I wrote it all out, and I read it, and then I was supposed to do the Lord's Prayer. And I prayed, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> and they all followed. So it's the grace with which you do it that counts, right, Carol? <laughs> Friends, pray with me. Oh God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations in all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Let's hear that first verse again. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Therefore, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. It sounds like a founder of the American Revolution, doesn't it? Give me liberty or give me death, as Patrick Henry said. Live free or die, as a neighboring state's license plate says. And interesting, so here we are, July 4th weekend. We've got these words of Paul celebrating the Declaration of Independence. And so I, I compared two defenders of religious liberty, Paul and James Madison in the Federalist Papers, because though they were separated by centuries, both men dealt with the dangers of factionalism, that deep strife, what we are calling now the, the deep polarization of our society. Um, Ezra Klein, I listened to his podcast, and he coined this phrase, middle finger politics, right? You know what that means, right? It's, it's not trying to come to some kind of agreement or reach the common good. It's about sticking it to the people you disagree with. So it's, it's a good time to think about what is freedom? especially religious liberty. So I'm going to outline the situation that both Paul and James Madison faced and how they thought we could transcend factionalism together. They both experienced adverse effects of religious strife. And, you know, verse 15, Paul says it so well. If you bite and devour each other, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. What a great metaphor, that sense of animals, you know, biting each other, tearing each other apart. Think of your last big argument. And, and somebody said something hurtful to you, and it felt like they just took a bite right out of you, didn't it? They took something of value, and, and you get in that fight or flight mode, you might want to take a bite right back out of them. And when that happens, you know, we're not in a respectful discussion anymore. And everybody leaves feeling diminished. You are diminished. You've got a few bites taken out of you. We can be consumed by each other's outrage. Paul understood factionalism because he lived it. Remember, Paul held the cloaks for the people who were stoning Stephen to death. That's the first time we hear about, he was then called Saul, later Paul. The first time we hear about him in the Bible, he's, he's basically holding the coats for a death squad, a, a religious execution. And in Acts 9.1, it says, the next thing that happened, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Sounds like a description of a mad bull, doesn't it? Breathing out murderous threats. You see, as Saul, he couldn't tolerate dissent. He couldn't handle that maybe some people had different interpretations of the law and scripture. So rather than discussion and debate, which his teacher Gamaliel was famous for, he chose violence, and repression. It wasn't until he had this dramatic vision, this encounter with the risen Christ, that, 
that he was changed and transformed and he spent the rest of his life as Paul the Apostle working for love and inclusion instead of repression. So he writes this letter to the Galatians and the issues there are probably going to sound a little strange to us, but they're familiar in another way. So the early church had Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus. And some of the Jewish followers in Galatia were saying, you know, if these Gentiles need to follow all of Le Leviticus, all of the codes, they have to keep kosher. And so the Gentiles were you know, thinking, well, you know, maybe we could give up shellfish. Not so sure about prosciutto. You know, pork, that's a tougher ask. Circumcision, that's where we're drawing the line. So what happened is both sides wanted to drive each other out of the church. And as Richard Rohr often says, the history of Christianity is true frequently about who's in and who's out. Nearly every letter that Paul writes is really trying to bridge this tremendous gap between Jew and Gentile culture and, and bring them together in the church because you know, he was both a Jew and trained in Greek. And so he's, he's a multicultural person by his background and he felt that the church needed to incorporate rather than have one side win over the other. So, Let's turn to James Madison. He was also profoundly concerned about factionalism, especially over religious dogma. And if you think about the 1770s, you know, many of the leaders of the American Revolution, they were Scotch-Irish, like the people who came to Maine, like, like my family, and they, they came because they were often experiencing religious persecution driven out of Scotland to Ireland and then on to the United States. And they, they knew what it was like to not be able to live their faith as they chose. And Europe had endured two centuries of warfare, much of it religious, a lot about power and control, but you throw religion into it and it's extremely volatile. So Madison was especially concerned that he saw the persecution of religious dissent by the Anglican church in Virginia. Because the, the state actually issued licenses to preach and they only gave it to Anglicans. So when a few Baptists started straying down into Virginia and preaching, they were beaten and imprisoned. And after one was drowned, Madison wrote a letter to a friend in 1774 where he lamented, quote, the diabolical hell of persecution. It's raging in the colony. There are no less than five or six well-meaning men who are in jail for publishing their religious sentiments. Pray for liberty of conscience to revive among us. So there's the problem in both centuries. So what did Paul and James Madison think that we could do about this? And what, what might we learn that we could do about this kind of factionalism and strife? So Paul's response in Galatians, I think, has really three important principles. First, he believed that freedom is God-given. Everyone is given a sense of freedom, and he really believed that the life, death, and resurrection of Christ frees humanity from every force that would diminish us. It, it frees us from anything that would make us less than fully human. Some of this is internal, freed from the power of sin. In other words, freed from the destructive power of living in ways that take us away from our best self. Paul also departed from religious legalism because he 
believed it created an impossible burden on our souls. That only if we were truly free could we experience the fullness of God's love for us. But Paul also believed that this freedom wasn't just inside, not just individual, but if we were free, then, then we were freed for community. That we were free to make love possible. And he said earlier in Galatians, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor male nor female, but all are one in Christ. It was a vision of unity. And then I think Paul's telling us freedom comes with responsibility. We have to work at maintaining freedom within a community. We can't just use it for our own selfish gain. And in verse 14, he sets that standard we know so well, love your neighbor as yourself. And you're probably identifying that as, oh, right, that's part of the great commandment that Jesus said in the Gospels. But do you know where it comes from? Leviticus. Yeah, that Leviticus, the laws, the rules, all of that, it's in Leviticus first. So what Paul's doing here is he's reminding his more legalistic-minded folks in Galatia that the law is about love. If you're trying to follow the law and you're not loving, you're doing it wrong. So freedom is God given. It comes with responsibilities. And the third point for Paul is freedom is something you have to cultivate. That there are virtues, fruits of the spirit, he called them, that you need to work at consistently and develop in order to maintain your freedom. Our vacation Bible school last week was focused on the fruits of the Spirit. They wrote them in big chalk letters out on our parking lot. You know, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. I think Violet has a slide for us. She can put them up there for you to see. Pick your favorite. What's your favorite fruit of the Spirit? Joy. I heard a joy. What else? What's your favorite? Kindness, generosity, another generosity, gratefulness, I heard of patience, gentleness, peace. Anybody for self-control? <laughs> Just noticing. What's the hardest one? <laughs> okay, self-control. Yeah. You know, think about it just for yourself for a moment. Pick the one that's the hardest. I'm picking patience. God knows I need patience. Work on it this week. And because each one of these fruits of the Spirit, if you think about it, if you put that out into a community, it, it creates a spirit of unity. You see, if, if you live that way, you're not going to be creating animosity. And, and this is really what, what Paul believed, that if you cultivate these, you'll create a better communal life. And I think so often in our world, we can get overwhelmed. I mean, it's tough out there. There, there's a lot out in the news and it just, it can overwhelm us. We want to tune out. We feel powerless. And the one thing we can always control is how we show up. Will we show up with these fruits of the Spirit? We can, we can start inward. And I think that matters. Living a virtuous life, having character, it matters. I still vote based on character. It's important. If you don't have character, you can't live out your policies. And Ben Franklin agreed. Ben Franklin said, only virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they think they need masters. 
So let's turn to Madison again for a moment. Now, Madison agreed with Paul about a lot of things, but he was a little more skeptical of human nature. You see, we had 2,000 years of track record between Paul and James Madison, and, and he could see that churches haven't always done the best at reining in their factionalism. And, and so he felt like we needed something more. And he said in the Federalist Papers number 10, so strong is the propensity of humankind to fall into mutual animosity where no substance occasion presents itself. The most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. In other words, we'll argue over nothing. So Madison believed beyond virtue, we needed guardrails. We needed things to secure our freedom and prevent this instinct of faction that makes us want to eliminate the people that we disagree with. Of course, having three separate branches of government and division of power was a great piece of that because you know power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? So when he advocated for the Bill of Rights, the very first amendment, freedom of speech, and, and what Madison really meant by that was freedom of conscience. See, that was essential to him, that every person has a freedom of conscience, that a God-given ability and right to practice our beliefs, to reason, and as long as we weren't impinging on someone else's freedom, that, that we should be able to make our own decisions about how we want to live. And he felt that religious freedom without coercion was central to a healthy republic. So that freedom of speech is not just the right to say what we want. It also included freedom of religion, freedom of the press, the right to assemble, the right to petition government that we need to protect dissenting voices because Madison really believed if you repress people you disagree with, it only makes them louder and more radical. It just creates this cycle of violence. He was deeply concerned that factionalism would destroy the Republic. He didn't take it for granted and neither did Paul. He knew that a divided church that was trying to preach the love of God for all people, if we're fighting with each other, then our message rings hollow. So that neither of them saw being free as inevitable. You don't just inherit it. It has to be a habit. Now, we are very fortunate as a congregation. We're relatively strong. We're harmonious, and it's not luck. We work at it. I saw the best of this church conducting two funerals during this week. What I saw were those, some of those fruits of the spirit, especially kindness and generosity and that sense of taking care of one another. And that's so important. But I also hear Madison and Paul in the background when society is swirling around us. And, and here's the challenge for us, I think. The, the work of not taking freedom for granted. And I'll tell a quick story. So several years ago, I was leading a workshop for the Massachusetts Conference. Uh, it was entitled, How to Have Brave and Bold Conversations in Church. And at the beginning, I asked people, what are the things you can't talk about in church? Race, gun control, substance abuse, suicide, climate change, money, sex, abortion. And the list kept growing longer and longer, and everybody's nodding. And finally, someone says, you know, it appears we can't talk about anything. No wonder we're in trouble. 
we've chosen a bland safety. Now, on the one hand, I don't want us constantly agitated talking about divisive issues all the time. But I also know that bland safety can be as harmful as strife. You see, avoidance won't protect us from the storms raging around us. If we pull up the drawbridge as a congregation, what's going to happen is the loudest and most destructive voices in our society will win. In a world where people were building walls of hostility against each other, Paul and James Madison challenged us to build bridges. Anyone can build a wall. It's easy. You just need a bunch of rocks or bricks or lumber or whatever's around. Anybody can build a wall and blot out someone else's humanity. Have you ever built a bridge? That takes some skill. So every bridge is a feat of engineering because it has to withstand a current and the rages of the water and everything around it. It's, it's very hard to work and build bridges, but bridges are so essential. You know, I live on Barter's Island. I got to go two bridges to get anywhere. You know, as they, without bridges, as they say in Maine, you can't get from there to here, right? Or here to there. So that's our challenge. We have to measure ourselves, not by the number of bricks we put on the wall, but how many bridges can we cross? Amen.